Um, let's start off with a bit of morbidity. Um, back in March of 2012, a Chinese motorist named Ling Gu, aged 23, passed away when he crashed his Ferrari 458 Spider um, in a massive car accident. Um, at the time, he was found in his vehicle alongside two women, both in states of undress, and they were purportedly uh, playing sex games or something of that nature while operating the vehicle. Um, so usually this would just be a fascinating story based on the humanity of it, uh, but there's another layer that gets added to this tale. Ling Gu was actually the son of Ling Jihua, who was at that point in time in 2012, the fourth highest ranked member of China's Politburo Standing Committee, which was the powerful governing party in China. So naturally, this was a massive media uh, outrage. There was a lot of thought going on around this story. Um, and while dying in a Ferrari mid-orgasm is not an awful way to go, uh, it did not quite appeal to the Chinese government. So the Chinese government improvised, and they got creative. And they created this massive cover-up to eliminate the story from coverage. They denied reports, had police change reports. They deleted search queries and search engines. They published their own story through Reuters, and they actually posted social media posts from Ling Gu's accounts, making it seem as though he still lived amongst us. Um, but stories like this don't just live on one side of the Pacific Ocean. They happen over here in America all the time. So here we have a few of them. Um, we have right here Watergate. You might be familiar with Watergate, a uh, fairly large cover-up involving President Nixon. Uh, you might have heard of a dog eating somebody's homework. That might be one. And you might have even uttered the words, Mom, I swear I'm not high. I just have pink eye. <laughs> These are all notable cover-ups that we do in our daily lives. These are all improv uh, forms of avoiding a problem or a misfortunate uh, occurrence or, or situation. So based on my experiences and the ones that we've talked about right up here, uh, I've come to find something that's kind of concerning to me, kind of frustrating to me. And it's that this profound power that we have as human beings to improvise and creatively ideate through improvisation is most often used in unfortunate situations and not as a proactive measure to do good for our world. So I think this has to do with predominantly our brains. So moving forward, hit it again. Uh, and it begs us to ask the question, why are we most creative when we lie? Why do we dig deepest into our greatest reserves of creativity when we're trying to escape blame or accountability. Um, and I think it's because at the heart of everything, improvisation is a survival mechanism. Um, improvisation is something that uh, we need just to make it through our daily lives. Uh, for instance, without improvisation, we would not have any recorded bear attacks. Um, without improvisation, you would have crashed your car. Without improvisation, after that first date, there would have been no goodnight kiss and thus no three children, a happy life, and white picket fence. Without improvisation, we lose these things. Uh, and it begins with our brains. So moving forward, um, a lot of research has been done on creativity and line and how it lights up the brain and certain aspects of it. Um, the two studies I want to talk about today were both done by Penn scientists, neuroscientists, and psychiatrists. The first was by Daniel Langelman. And moving forward. Um, Daniel Langelman studied how the brain reacted to lying, what part of the brain lighted up when we lied or had to spontaneously react to situations. And he found that three parts of the brain are activated when we do so. First is the interior cingulated cortex, which deals with error. Then we have the prefrontal cortex, which monitors complex cognitive behavior. And then third, we have the parietal cortex, which deals with sensory issues. Um, another study that was done by Scott Barry Kaufman, once again a Penn professor, discovered what we do when we are creative, how our brain reacts when we're creative. And it actually comes down to three cognitive motors. Um, we have the executive action motor, which deals with um, making complex decisions. We have the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a very good word. Uh, we're not going to worry about that word at this point in time. But what it does is it deals with external events. Uh, and then the third one we have is the imagination network, and it deals with the imagination. That one's much easier for me. And we found that these three different motors in the brain that deal with all these different things are actually driven, driven by three different parts of the brain. Um, you might have heard of them before. They are the anterior cingulated cortex, as it appears here. We have the prefrontal cortex and the parietal cortex. So 
we see a connection here. And while this does not give us a clear understanding of why the brain is most creative when it lies, we do see a neural framework as to why these things work together in unison. But there are consequences to this. Um, we actually have reached a point in time when some of our most identified brands, when our elected leaders are actually no longer considered trustworthy by us, when they should be the people and the brands that are driving our world forward. So I have this little infographic right here to bring up. 94% of people think that politicians are lying on the job, <laughs> while we also believe that 92% of business leaders are doing the exact same thing. And who can blame us when you have things happen like this? But I want to say one thing to the American people. I want you to listen to me. I'm going to say this again. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Yeah, all right, Bill. All right. Yeah, but we have reached a point in time where we're at a crisis of confidence in those that should be leading us. So what I'm asking for us all to do today is to take part in a perspective shift on how we use improvisation to creatively ideate in our personal and professional lives. And I think what it comes down to are three steps. And the first step we're going to talk about today is inclusion. So I think inclusion is, uh, in this sense, a little different than what we usually look at inclusion as. Um, from an early age, we have this habit of determining who can and cannot improvise, who can and who cannot be creative. For instance, at the K through 12 level, we identify kids um, as, well, we'll get to that in a second here. We should talk first about my comedy team. Let's go back a little bit. Yeah. So here's an example of a group of kids that are allowed to improvise and who are allowed to be creative. This group of kids is called Comedy Wars. And Comedy Wars is a group that I'm a part of that performs every Wednesday here on campus. And after every single show, bar none, I guarantee you I can expect one or two people to come up to us and they ask, how did you, how did you do that? How did you just think off the top of your head like that? How did you make those scenes happen, those stories happen? And the thing that's interesting to me isn't that that's something that I get to do or that we do that or that we even do it well. It's that people cannot believe that improvisation is a tool that can be used or they're not aware that they're using it already on a day-to-day -day basis in their own lives. And we're all improvisers, not just myself because I have a formal title, but because we just do. I mean, I think it's becoming down to this classification complex that we talked about. So back to the K through 12 level. We have our bookworms, and then we have the kids that are titled the class clowns, and we combine them, otherwise known as the virgins. <laughs> but this is just one example of classification in the K through 12 level that we do to keep kids stuck in different spots. Furthermore, from a governmental standpoint, we determine what is and what is not valuable in a skill set. For instance, right now we're seeing a massive raise in how much money we're spending on STEM education, which is great, STEM is an awesome thing but at the expense of how many fine arts budgets and programs. Programs that innately gift children with the ability to think creatively and to use their imagination. And this is really concerning me because it's created this stark dichotomy whereby we have our creatives and our account persons, our businessmen and women and our artists, our idealists and our pragmatists. And as a result of this, we assign professionals jobs and alongside those jobs, we pigeonhole them with abilities, with customs, with behavior, with dress, and even language. For instance, how many clergy members have you ever heard use the phrase YOLO? And this is not just because it theologically is in opposition to what they believe. <laughs> you do not only live once, some would say, but because we do not allow people in certain jobs to express themselves. And this bothers me. Um, when I was in middle school, I took a personality inventory test. And on that test, I was told that I would be a warehouse manager. I think a noble occupation, a noble vocation. We need those people. Um, and in my head, I didn't think to myself when I got that ruling back, oh man, now I have to catalog inventory for the rest of my life. That didn't plague me. Rather, as opposed to self-censoring my abilities within that position, I thought to myself, wow, just think of how big of a party I could throw in a warehouse. <laughs> that would be wild. Uh, and I think it's important that we use this method of thinking, and that brings us to our second step, yes anding. Yes anding is a fundamental principle of improv. If you've ever heard anybody talk about improvisation, yes and is one of those things that comes up. And the way yes and works is simple. If we were to do a drill with my uh, team right now, I'd be standing right here. I would have another person standing right here. For the sake of this today, I'll be two people. The first person would start off by saying something along the lines of, the weather is nice today. And this person would not refute that point. Rather, they would say, yes, the weather is nice today. And that makes it a great day for parasailing. 
We could go back and forth, repeating this, agreeing with one another, and building on that idea until eventually, where we started off on planet Earth having a nice day with great weather, we could make it to the moon. We could make it to Pluto. We could bring it back as a planet. Anybody with me? Yes, anding allows us to go beyond what we begin with. It allows us to organically grow our ideas, and it keeps us from telling each other no. Most ideas aren't bad ideas. They're just not developed yet, or they haven't been believed in enough or had enough effort poured into them to become something big and beautiful. Yes, anding keeps us from listing our first three ideas and pursuing them, because our first three ideas are generally piss. Because they're based on two things, either cliches or securities, things that we find that allow them to be easily accomplishable. And any good idea is not easily accomplished. Furthermore, yes, anding allows us to defeat the self-censor in our brains. Another activity that we do all the time when I do improv workshops is I ask everybody in the audience to think of a box in front of them and to put something in that box. Before I ask them to turn to the person to their left or to their right and say what was in that box, I stop them very quickly. And this is because people have a strange tendency to put nefarious things in that box and then self-censor what that thing is when they go to tell the person sitting next to them. They change it. Don't do that. Whatever is in your box, leave it in that box because it was probably something that based on the secrecy that you had in your mind, you weren't afraid of, you thought was pretty funny, and it might have even been a part of human anatomy. These things make that idea fun, cool, interesting, different, contentious, any one of those different words. And we need those things to stay in those boxes, otherwise we end up with the same dour cheese in a box, or I had loose leaf in my box. What is that? What does that say about us as people? And that brings me uh, to my third point about yes-anding. Yes-anding encourages the lack of self-censorship in our communities. It allows us to confirm with one another in community, be it friends, family, roommates, coworkers, that everybody is a genius because we believe in their ideas and their ideas have value and merit to us. So that brings me to my third point about what we need to do to change this perspective on improvisation and creativity, and that is we need to declare war on Mensa. Um, I think the most dangerous word that we throw around in culture and society is the word genius. We try to measure genius with IQ, we balance it with EQ, and all along we only allow a few people to definitively believe in their genius. We only title a few people with genius. And I think we need to stop worrying about quotients and start considering ourselves with world records. There's this strange notion that only somebody who can cram a bunch of hot dogs down their throat can hold a world record. Only somebody who can build a massive tower can hold a world record. Uh, and I don't agree with this. I think that's ridiculous, asinine thinking. I would prefer that we look at world records as little things, little bits and pieces that color our world and color our persons. So for instance, I'm standing on this red dot right now. If I were to um, take a knee, say, and just start poking this spot on the ground, just for a hot sec here. Bear with me. I want to make sure I get the record. I can guarantee you that for the most part, I probably hold the world record for the most time somebody has poked that one particular spot on this rug in that window of time. <laughs> and I'm proud of that. If we stop worrying so much about titles, diagnoses, whatever you want to call it, and start thinking about these little world records that we have, the amount of times that we fart in our own beds, how many licorice sticks we can cram into our mouths over the course of a 30 second second interval, that stuff is what's interesting to me. That's what colors our experiences, pours into us the sort of innovation and ideation that only we can express because we have that record. We own that record, and I guarantee you, you own 30,000 plus of them. But we don't look at them like that. We don't see people as being that profound, that big, that wonderful in what is such a wide cosmic environment. We like to minimize ourselves. We like to say, well, I'm only an accountant. What do you mean I have to paint? Or, I'm an actor, what do you mean I have to balance my budget? These things don't compute to us because we don't see ourselves as being that dynamic across a spectrum of experiences. And that bothers me. And so we get to a point today, we're asking the question, you know, why are we even talking about this? Honestly, I'm just kind of hungry. Um, and I think it's important that we think about improv and we think about ideation not in just a creative or aesthetically pleasing way. But when we think about what we're losing when we don't proactively ideate, when we don't improvise, when we don't try new things, is we're losing social and human capital. We're not taking chances. We're not doing the things that we need to do to progress as a society. And if you do not believe in me, if you don't believe that I'm qualified to tell you this, then let's look at companies and uh, different sorts of institutions that are also using improvisation as an ideating mechanism. 
Moving over to the next slide, we have companies like Pixar, which uses a consistent improvisation process when they're ideating for their movies, things like Finding Nemo or Toy Story. We have schools like Stanford, MIT, UCLA, and Duke, which are now requiring students to take improvisation courses in their MBA programs to encourage uh, improvisation and ideation at that level of business in the C-suite. And we also have companies like Funworks, which is out of San Francisco, which is pairing brands like Pandora, Virgin America, and HP with improvisers to sit down and craft strategy for their campaigns. Improv is kind of at the precipice of becoming a culturally used phenomenon across industry, across all these different spectrums. And we're getting there, but we're not getting there quick enough yet, which is really the reason why I'm talking today. But it does happen. And I want to ask you, um, if we didn't improvise, if we didn't take chances, um, if, say, an engineer had heard over and over and over again, electric cars are impractical, impossible to mass market, impossible to create infrastructure for, then where would we be? in the electric car market, as opposed to Elon Musk in 2016 rela releasing the Tesla Model 3 sedan, the first mass market electronic vehicle. We would still be stuck with Carl Franz's Petrocar, which was released in 1886, <laughs> 130 years ago. Where would we be, all those movie buffs, if Reed Hastings had not released Netflix and Chill in 2011? Where would we be? Where would the fleeting intimacy be that so happily sustains our romantic lives. <laughs> I don't have 130 years <laughs> to wait for the next life-altering development. I don't have 130 years to go from Petrocar to Tesla Model 3. Well, maybe I have 130 years, but as long as I'm subject to Big Pharma, I won't. <laughs> and what I'm concerned about is that if we move forward, we're talking about the power of a single idea here today, not the power of a single response. We're stuck in a PR culture. Currently, more, five times more PR professionals are employed than journalists. Five times more people built to not necessarily spin the truth, but alter the truth, alter the situation or circumstances around the truth, than people who are here to report honesty and what actually matters and what is actually pertinent to us as a developing culture and world. I'm concerned about that. You should be too. So I'm pledging today that I want to help you to take back creativity and improvisation from the liars, from those that choose to mislead us as opposed to lead us. And I think that all begins with improv a single idea, and in doing so, improving our world. All right, thank you very much.